Thank you. Um, it's a little daunting replacing Stephen Chu, so <laughs> I'm going to keep this relatively short. Uh, I think that uh, this uh, conference today takes place at a very auspicious time. Uh, it's, you know, I've been doing this, uh, I've worked on energy for a long time, and I you know, always get up and say, you know, it's a time of change. But you look at what's happening right now in the world and how fast it's moving. Uh, this may truly be a unique time in, in our history. Uh, you look at the events in the Middle East. Um, I took my car this morning to fill up, and uh, we passed four dollars a gallon in the United States now. Um, which, by the way, was DOE's estimated price for 2030. Um, we are now, I mean, the, the recognition of the concerns about the externality effects, which were very exclusively uh, debated here in the United States, not, not always to be resolved, uh, dealing with climate, dealing with the environment, dealing with energy and security, uh, are now more prevalent throughout the world. I go to meetings in the Middle East, I go to meetings in Southeast Asia, I go to meetings in Latin America, these same issues keep coming up. I had a delegation from Singapore the other day that spent their entire time talking about energy security in Singapore, and then I met with a group from Iceland who talked about energy security in Iceland. Uh, we are not only a global world in terms of trade, but we're a global world in terms of worries and concerns. I'd like to make four points uh, that I take away from this meeting, and to some extent, this meeting only emphasized them um, uh, more because I think I've always, always felt that these were four very important points. First, the scope of what's going on in China is truly impressive. Uh, you know, every time I listen to a presentation on Chinese energy policy, there's always a wow moment when they bring up another achievement and you say, I don't believe that that could possibly happen. Uh, some of the obvious ones, you take a look at the rate of growth in terms of electricity capacity, and China for the last three or four years has been uh, growing at a rate equal to the entire uh, energy capacity, electricity capacity um, in France. Um, no one in 2002 or 2001 ever predicted that China would be able to do even half of this. Um, the other day I noticed that um, China opened up a new coal-fired electricity plant uh, that has an efficiency level of 46%. Um, I used to teach my students that 38% was the highest possible given thermodynamics that you could have for a coal-fired plant. Uh, I have to rewrite that lecture. Um, transportation, we had a panel uh, that I, my panel that I moderated uh, pointed out that uh, last year um, China sold 18 million cars or, uh, or passenger vehicles. Uh, the United States, just for those of you who want to compare, sold 12, and that was up from 10 the previous year. Uh, so China is full, the, the, the magnitude and the scope of what's happening in China is probably unparalleled in human history. But the thing that really impresses me about China is the willingness to objectively evaluate their performance. China is always trying to do better. Um, and when they don't meet their goals, they, they basically work to improve. And within two or three years, they have improved. Uh, their ability to admit mistakes, work on those mistakes, and basically find the options that can correct them uh, contrasts, uh, sometimes I feel, with what we go on in the United States, where we're not too good about really objectively evaluating our performance. In China, they do, and in China, they do make these changes. Um, we've been having a big debate in this country over our future energy policy, and uh, right now, it's losing out to austerity. Um, and we are cutting back on energy technology R&D. Um, and it's interesting that we're doing this at exactly the same time that China, in its 12th five-year plan, is agreed to significantly increase theirs. So China is going in one direction, and the United States is going another in a critical area of technology innovation. The second uh, point I, I, that I found uh, sort of uh, that I found emphasized in a lot in the panels that I attended 
was the enormous diversity of uh, opinion and perspective that exists in China, which contrasts with the opinion a lot of people have in the West that China is all homogenous and uh, has a consensus on all the issues. In fact, I found enormous differences in almost every panel I listened to. Uh, there is a diversity of incentives for uh, people working in government and in the private sector, and there's diversity of opinion. And this shows up critically in the relationships uh, between the federal governments and the provinces. It shows up among the provinces uh, and among the various interest groups in China. Uh, Tony Sage, who is a colleague of mine at the Kennedy School, likes to say that you can find any opinion you want in a senior official in China, if you look, that there is that much diversity in that country. And I think that this, this one of the interesting um, things to watch in China going forward is how this diversity is going to work itself out as the central government and the provincial governments try to meet both their economic, environmental, and social goals. And the tension between them, I think, is going to become more palpable in the uh, years ahead as China's growth begins to slow down, which inevitably will. There's no way that China can grow at 10 to 12 percent. Now, I realize I would have said that seven years ago and been proven wrong, but if you look at history of the world over the last 300 years, uh, the 7 percent or 6 percent figure is much more realistic uh, for a long period of time than the 10 to 11 percent figure. My third point uh, is the issue of the potential of partnerships between the United States and China. Uh, this is one that Secretary Chu, if he was, uh, if you could get him on the screen here, uh, I know would raise with you. Um, both countries face significant energy problems. Um, if you look at China's rate of energy growth, uh, and you project it out till 2040, Given the present levels of supply and even supply commitments, China is going to be about 40% short, have a 40% shortfall in 2040. They recognize this, and that is why they're investing heavily in almost every energy source there is, both from a point of view perspective of R&D, but also going out and beginning to purchase oil all over the world, uh, entering the gas contracts in which they're bringing gas, not 500, 800 kilometers, but three, four, five thousand kilometers from places like Iran and Kazakhstan all the way to Shanghai. Uh, a pipeline that costs an astronomical figure if you incorporate all of the capital costs. Um, China is uh, incredibly aware that they have to find new energy sources and develop energy. They are fully aware of the importance of research uh, of R&D. Now, if you look at what does the United States have to offer, uh, despite the enormous uh, gains in China in the area of technology innovation, if you want to know where the revolutionary research and development breakthroughs are occurring in the energy area, the fact is they're still occurring in the United States. Where the process breakthroughs, the ability to uh, produce and manufacture uh, various energy technologies more efficiently, where that progress is being made is in China. And this is a natural partnership, but this will not be an easy partnership. I could tell you why it benefits both countries, but there are still significant problems of trust, um, where the United States is very reluctant to share uh, a lot of its um, new technology, new technologies with China on the fear that China will cannibalize them and then be able to produce them a lot cheaper and therefore take the market away from the US. And China is, a, is very uh, concerned about whether the United States is truly interested in cooperating. A Chinese official the other day told me that we keep being asked to sign memorandums of understanding with China, I mean with the United States, and uh, all we do is have ceremonies and nothing happens. Um, so, um, if both countries face significant problems, and I do personally believe that there is a real opportunity, but there is also, uh, I think that, uh, I'm going to back away and just say, if you look at these as two paths, and you can take one path as a cooperative path, 
and one path is a fully competitive path. I think if the governments don't work uh, and take assertive positions on this, the natural instinct, unfortunately, will lend it more to the competitive path than the cooperative path. But I truly believe that the benefits to both countries are much higher if they take the cooperative path. And I think that I really hope that that can be done, but it's not going to be an easy, um, it's not going to be easy to get there. My fourth point, I've been on the faculty here at, at Harvard for, um, I guess, 32 years now. Um, they keep telling people about the fact that I spent nine years in state government. And you know, that's sort of like telling people that uh, ancient history, that's so long ago that uh, I noticed my office has now been converted into a restroom. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so, uh, it's been quite a while. So I've been here a, uh, a long time, and I think the thing that always amazes me uh, is how amazingly talented our students are. When I walk through Harvard Yard, I have to keep pinching myself and saying, you know, I'm here teaching, you know, the brightest and most able uh, students uh, in the world. and. Um, you know, Harvard does. They attract the men and women who are going to be our future leaders. And I think they probably would be the, our future leaders whether they came to Harvard or they went to Yale or they went anywhere. Um, but we do attract a disproportion of them here. Um, and uh, we do take full credit, by the way, of anything they do once they leave here. Um, and it's a real privilege as a faculty member to have the opportunity uh, to work with these young men and women. Um, and I think this uh, event is probably uh, a testimony to how talented and their perseverance and how hardworking they are. Um, a delegation of this group came to see me, uh, I think it was October, and said, we want to do a conference on China and energy. Um, and I said, well, do you have any money? And they said, no. Uh, do you have any speakers? And they said, no. Um, <laughs> but we're going to get Secretary Chu. And I said, well, uh, I doubt that. Uh, <laughs> and I said, no, no, we can get Secretary Chu. We're going to work at it. Um, and um, today, uh, I'm told this conference was sold out uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Secretary Chu would have uh, been on the screen here if it wasn't for the fact that the Tea Party tried to shut the government down. Um, and they put together uh, six very impressive panels. And while I'm a little biased on this topic, I think you got one of the best uh, and most uh, articulate and smart young, well, she's not young anymore, uh, women in all of energy in the world here, and Sue Tierney, who I also told you you wouldn't be able to get because she's too busy. Uh, and so I think that uh, there are a whole uh, list of people uh, at the back of your program. I'm not going to list them all. But uh, I think that the performance today of uh, Lucy Fang, uh, Yu Min Ye, and Claire Zhang is uh, truly impressive. And if uh, my advice to you is get to know these people, uh, because in a few years they're going to be uh, in positions to make major contributions and if this conference is any manifestation of where their career is going, I think I'm going to sleep a little better knowing that the future energy challenge is going to be their problem, not mine anymore. <laughs> and uh, I think they're going to handle it very, very well. So I hope you join me in thanking the organizer of this conference for a superb job.